Welcome to the AWS Summit Berlin. It's great to have you all here. This summit is an opportunity for us to come together, share knowledge, and raise the bar of what's possible. We have a busy agenda planned for you today, full of exciting presentations, exciting discussions, and lots and lots of networking opportunities. I want to take a brief moment to thank all of you for being with us today. We know time is valuable, and we appreciate the commitment you're making to spending an entire day with us. Talking about welcome, it's not that common that we would do this on a summit stage, but I just did not want to miss the opportunity to introduce you to one of our latest members of the AWS DACH CEE family, Stefan Höchbauer. He joined us. So, so Stefan joined us four weeks back as the new VP Central. He comes with over 25 years, 25 years of experience in technology, leading sales, driving digital transformation, and delivering results for our customers across the industry. So warm welcome, Stefan. Great you're here. Hope you're enjoying the event as much as I do and meeting many, many of our great customers and partners. Now, I guess you would agree that we live in turbulent times. It's been over one year now that Russia has invaded the Ukraine. And if you think about it, data sits at the heart of every government and modern society. Think about things like population register, tax, land, bank, ownership records. And what happened if that data got lost? Early on, Snowball units in their shockproof gray containers were flown from Dublin to Poland. And it was brave Ukrainian men and women who got the snowballs over the border into the country to help save the country's most essential government data. The project involved 27 ministries, 18 universities, the country's largest online learning school, and dozens, dozens of private sector companies, including Privatbank, the country's largest financial services institution. And what has helped the country is it, they could continue operations every day, even under rocket fire, and even despite all the power outages. So, in July 2027, President Zelensky has awarded AWS the Ukraine Peace Prize. And Amazon has invested 75 million USD to help the country. And of course, we're going to continue doing so. As an Amazonian, it, it does make me really, really proud to see how we're leveraging the scale and our technology to really make an impact in the world, especially amidst this terrible war. But what is it that we can take away from this example of this brave country? What is it that we can derive for our country, for our industry, for the things we are discussing here today? Can the U Ukraine actually be a role model when it comes to digitization? And I get it, it's an extreme example where a country got forced into digitization more or less overnight. But I'm asking if data as sensitive as government data can be securely stored and run in the cloud, what else would be possible? Now, the war in the Ukraine, but clearly two years of COVID, have changed the business landscape. We have seen companies, entire industries being disrupted based on energy prices that have spiraled, supply chains that have, that have been disrupted. And especially in Germany, you know, with all our big footprint in automotive and manufacturing, those consequences were, were felt and were, were really tough because companies just wouldn't get the parts they need in order to continue operations. The good thing is the cloud can help mitigate some of these challenges, such as decreasing energy cost. We've done a survey with 300 companies across Europe, and we found that by moving to the cloud, companies can save up to 
IT and facility cost. And this is not just because you move energy consumption from an on-prem data center into the cloud, but it's also because of the business innovation that is being possible and that can be unlocked. Think of things like predictive maintenance or we have seen companies in a very smart way aligning their production schedule with energy cost. Another example is cloud-based supply chain management. And McKinsey predicts that now every three and a half years, production around the world will face severe disruption. And that, that only adds to the urgency to do something. We see so many legacy systems at our customers that just cannot cope with the ever-growing volatility of supply and demand. And AWS services like IoT Sidewise, Amazon Forecast, Amazon Supply Chain, they can provide the end-to-end -end visibility that customers really need in order to track and trace their production processes in real time. Thirdly, we need to build organizations for resilience. And what it also means, we need to build our tech stack for resilience. With AWS, you can define and measure resilience goals. You can identify and mitigate risks early on, experiment, build highly and highly available and resilient applications, and detect behaviors that would deviate from, from normal patterns. In a study we conducted with IW Consult, we found that two-thirds of companies that use AWS said that they were able to increase their resilience. Nine out of ten said that the cloud helps them increase their security posture. And almost two-thirds again said that the cloud even helps them drive revenue. So the impact on the German economy is quite, quite substantial. And in numbers, we're talking 11.2 billion euro that were generated at the back of AWS in a single year. And we created 600 jobs in 2021 alone. Now, tens of thousands of active customers in Germany are using AWS. And there is a number of renowned brands up there. Adidas, Vorwehr, Kercher, Six, Siemens, healthcare leaders such as BioNTech, Covestro, there's also brands there that may surprise you. And one example of, of those is the Fachklinikum Mainschleife. It, it became the first hospital in Germany that migrated its entire IT infrastructure into the cloud. And obviously, the stakes are very high when it comes to technology, especially when you think of elektronische Patientenakte in Germany. Now, the Fachklinikum said that one of the main reasons why they migrated into the cloud is because of our shared responsibility model, which means that a lot of the key security principles are already baked into the infrastructure. So the hospital only needed to add certain elements to reach full compliance. We also have a large number of software companies among our customers. And SAP is one of them. They are special. They're a major customer of ours. But they're also a very strategic partner of AWS. For 15 years now, we have been co-innovating together with them on your behalf, including in the area of RISE, to really accelerate your transformation to the intelligent enterprise. But why do software companies like SAP why do they use AWS? Now, because in today's software as a service and platform-centric world, ISVs can derive a lot of benefits when moving to the cloud, such as lower cost per transaction, such as higher developer productivity. And even 9 out of 10 ISVs said that the cloud helps them to massively increase their security posture. Talking about ISV partnerships for a second, today I'm really excited and proud to announce 
that we have signed a strategic collaboration agreement with MSG. Many of you might know MSG for being a leading solution and services provider to the financial services industry or for being an SAP powerhouse. So their expertise combined with our leading cloud platform will help our customers migrate their most critical and regulated workloads to the cloud. Really excited. And then before you leave to enjoy the summit, I want to thank our global sponsors, Datadog, Dynatrace, Palo Alto Networks, LaunchDarkly, and MongoDB. Without all of you, an event like that would not be possible. We're also as grateful to our Diamond, Emerald, and Platinum sponsors. And what unites all of them is that they are all super passionate, like we are, about your transformation. So please, I encourage you to go and talk to them during the summit. I am now happy to welcome on stage the AWS Vice President for S3, Kevin Miller. Good morning. Thank you, Florian. I just continue to be amazed by all of the innovation and the transformation that we're seeing here in Berlin. And it's so great to be back here with all of you. Honestly, nothing really uh, energizes me more as hearing stories from you firsthand about things that you're doing and building on top of AWS with all of the elasticity, the simplicity, and the features that we build. So for those of you that are joining me for the first time, I'm the global leader for Amazon S3, which launched back in 2006 and was AWS's first generally available service. I've personally been a part of AWS for the last 15 years, and it's amazing how far we've come, but we just think we're getting started. When I was on stage last year, I shared my perspective with you on how the technology decisions that you make today set the context for the decisions and what happens in the future. Now, a lot has really happened in the last year, and there's a lot of uncertainty and change going on. And so I think that just underscores how important it is to have a technology provider that listens intently to your needs and innovates on your behalf. Last year was another big year for AWS, and we launched more than 3,300 new features and services. And some of the conversations that we had last year are this year going to be very different based on all the new innovation that we've introduced. And then 2023, this year, is already off to a fast start, and it really promises to be another year of exciting innovation. Just in the last 30 days alone, we've made several interesting announcements. For example, we launched the INF2 instances. These are purpose-built for deep learning inference, and they deliver the high performance at the lowest cost in EC2 for uh, generative artificial intelligence models, including the large language models and vision transformers that we're often talking about now. And they actually have 50% better performance per watt over comparable instances in Amazon EC2. We also launched VPC Lattice, which is a new application layer network that really simplifies service-to-service -service communication, including applications and services running in EC2, in containers, and in serverless. Our Elastic File System has increased its maximum throughput by a factor of three, and now exceeds or it reaches 10 gigabytes per second of throughput. We've also launched a number of machine learning services. I'll talk about those in a little bit. And just in the last 30 days, as you can see, there's been a number of interesting new announcements. One prominent example of innovative technology is what I just mentioned, generative AI. And obviously, in the last few months, we've all seen just some of the amazing benefits that this technology can bring, and it's really captured many imaginations. I personally believe that generative AI will have a transformative effect on nearly every industry. And underneath it, it's powered by large language models, foundation models, that are trained on massive data sets. And they already have the ability to do many you know, complex nuances in written communication and provide answers in multiple styles, generate code, and generate incredibly realistic photo and video. 
AWS's mission with generative AI, just as it is with really every technology category, is to remove the barriers of entry, including things like the need to have deep understanding and experience in a domain, as well as all of the requirements and complexity of managing infrastructure, as well as the prohibitive cost structures that often occur in doing things uh, independently. And so we're going to help you, like we do in every area, continue to focus on what matters most to you, building what's never been built before for your customers atop the latest technology. That's frankly been the way that we've worked for years. I personally think there's, been, there's no better time to build, migrate, or transform how we do just about everything. And I see customers doing this. I see a flywheel that really starts with the spark of an idea, a light bulb moment, or what we might call a catalyst. And that is the moment that you kind of go past yesterday's constraints to consider what might be possible. You know, one example of this was going all the way back to Archimedes, who uncovered the physical law of buoyancy in his bathtub. That was the catalyst moment, or that light bulb moment. Another example, you know, fast forwarding 1800 years, Sir Isaac Newton developed the theory of gravity after observing an apple fall from a tree. Or fast forwarding even further to the late 1940s when Jacob Rabinow took the idea of platters and saw the opportunity for a hard drive while he was working at what became the National Institute of Standard and Technology. But after these catalyzing moments, each of these inventors did more, frankly, a lot more. They took the tools, they used all the tools of the day to build something, and then they started running experiments. And when they looked to see if when their invention worked and when it didn't, they took measurements, they iterated, they tried again. In short, not only did they catalyze that initial moment, but they began spinning a flywheel of improvements that continue to this day. So for example, we continue to learn and improve the design of ships based on the idea of buoyancy. I was doing some research for this talk and realized that there are companies that are doing incredible innovation around gravity, building batteries using weights and gravity, which I think is super cool. Or of course, we go, you know, we today with S3 continue to use modern HDDs to build these large scale storage systems. And did you know that in S3, tens of thousands of customers have data that is spread over more than a million hard drives. That is really the power of the scale of AWS. You know, we live in an age where there is so much technology, but incredible opportunity to solve big problems. How can you improve your customer experience by a factor of two? Or how could you reduce the carbon impact of your applications by 50% or 80%? or build more accessible applications that increase opportunity and equality. These opportunities are just all around us. And I would guess in this room alone, there's a lot of you in this room, there are thousands of good ideas waiting to be catalyzed and developed. So I'm going to challenge you to think about one problem that you would like to see solved. You can be the catalyst to solving that problem. Let's talk about how you might do it. After catalyzing, I think you need to be able to quickly build using the right, the best tools. And then you need to be able to test, measure, learn, and iterate, just like we've seen with buoyancy, gravity, and data storage. As millions of customers appreciate every day, I think that AWS is the best place for you to build your ideas and turn your sparks into reality. And why is that? First, because I think we have the broadest selection of innovative services to support your existing and future applications. We have great price performance and work to improve your unit costs for you on your behalf every single year. And then we also bring this infrastructure and services to applications wherever they're running, whether it's in the cloud, at the edge, or in your own data center with a consistent experience. So let's just dig deeper into this first area. We have over 200 services today, and that really allows us to support virtually any application, more than any other cloud provider, whether it's you know, compute, storage, and networking services, the database and AI and IoT services, or even completely new areas like quantum computing or robotics. And then within each of those areas, we have deep functionality within each of those services. Since we launched our first service 17 years ago, we've really focused on just supporting every type of application in the cloud. And that means they're designed to support enterprise use cases, high performance computing, IoT, serverless, container-based. It runs the whole gamut. 
And then we also understand that some applications have certain requirements that need to continue to run on-premises, whether that's because of latency or specific data residency needs. And so that's why we've provided the tools to manage those applications across a hybrid cloud environment. So if we dig into Amazon EC2, today there are more than 600 different instance types, providing a variety of combinations of compute, memory, and networking, and all the other resources you need, like a GPU, to match the specific needs of your application. So I'm sure you can choose one that works for your needs. But EC2 is just one of the many compute options that we offer. You can use our container orchestration services and choose from either the Amazon Elastic Container Service or our Elastic Kubernetes Service. Or go completely serverless with Lambda and Fargate, where all you have to do is focus on your application, because we handle all of the management of the infrastructure. And we've really been a pioneer in this space since launching Lambda way back in 2014. And in fact, since then, we've added more than 100 new features into Lambda. One of the things we launched recently in Lambda was something called SnapStart. And with this, we're seeing customers see up to a 10 times faster function startup for their Java functions with typically minimal to no code changes. And this is really the power of AWS in the cloud when you can just wake up one morning and now this application is 10 times faster. That's the kind of magic that I like. One customer that's really enjoying the benefits of serverless is Bosch. And as Bosch began developing their first cloud-connected device, it was actually a heat pump system that then allowed technicians to remotely monitor, analyze, and troubleshoot it, they needed a solution to be able to handle the highly variable workloads while requiring the least amount of effort from their teams to manage the infrastructure. Lambda was really the perfect fit for them in terms of the burstiness of the workload as well as managing the cost and all of the infrastructure. We handle all of the back-end infrastructure provisioning and so that they can focus on their application, which really has resulted in them having better than expected sales results from these new applications. So regardless of whether you're using serverless, containers, or EC2 instances then, your applications are going to need some storage. So again, going back to S3 launching in 2006, we have almost two decades of experience building these storage services with all of the things you need, the security, resiliency, durability, and elasticity. And then whether it's object, block, or file services, we have a portfolio that covers you. And we operate these services at an immense scale. They have trillions of objects, processing hundreds of millions of requests per second, and store, frankly, exabytes of data. And we're also con uh, committed to delivering exceptional performance in our services at the best cost. And that is really what drives a lot of day-to-day -day innovation in my engineering teams. One of the examples of this is our Nitro system, which when we were optimizing our traditional virtualization system, we started to realize that we were reaching some limits and we had to make a pretty dramatic change in our architecture if we wanted to continue increasing performance and security. Now, hypervisors are designed typically, you know, historically, to operate on a single machine and don't think about how do I, am I going to work and optimize across a whole fleet of machines. That was one of the key realizations that we had that caused us to rethink everything and it became the spark for creating the Nitro system, which is, allows us to offload almost all of the virtualization functions onto dedicated hardware. And so what this allows us to do is build security in at the chip level and continuously monitor and protect hardware against potential threats. And then over time, it's enabled other security features like our Nitro enclaves, which are, allow you to create isolated compute environments for processing highly sensitive data, like, like key material. And then overall, it's also allowed us to deliver a, a performance advantage that helps your applications. So if you take, for example, our latest generation, or our, sorry, our current sixth generation x86 instances, these all use the Nitro system, and they can deliver 15% higher throughput on some workloads compared to other cloud providers using the exact same CPU because of the system. And our innovation certainly hasn't stopped with Nitro. You know, if you talk, think about AWS Graviton, this was our foray to developing our own processors going back to 2018. And these deliver the best end-to-end -end performance and energy efficiency. 
We've now gotten to our third generation of Graviton processors and Graviton 3 base instances, which are 25% faster than Graviton 2 and use less than 60%, up to 60% less energy than a comparable EC2 instance. So we've been seeing a lot of customers you know, interested in pursuing the energy and cost benefits of Graviton, and they've achieved up to a 40% better price performance just by shifting those workloads to run on Graviton instances. For example, Epic Games has been a longtime customer, and they went all in on AWS back in 2018 to deliver all the storage, analytics, and scaling demands for their games like Fortnite. Now today, Fortnite runs almost entirely on AWS. And they use tens of thousands of EC2 instances powered by Graviton processors, scaling their compute capacity at an optimal price performance, supporting, of course, millions of players around the world. And so we're just continuing to innovate the performance on your behalf. Another example I want to share with you is around SRD. You know, one of the constants in networking over the mass many, many years, decades really, is TCP, the Transmission Control Protocol which allows you to send reliable streams of data from one point to another on the network and really underpins the internet as we know it today. But customers that are building high-performance computing applications told us that they needed lower tail latency and higher throughput. And because we want to enable, again, any application to run on AWS, we went and invented this new network protocol called SRD. It allows us to utilize the massive data center networks that we build and achieve higher bandwidth and lower latency for the most demanding network applications. The next thing we did with SRD is with our ENA Express uh, capability, we expanded SRD to bring those performance benefits into the mainstream by making it easy to deploy as an ENA network interface, which you frankly just, you know, you cannot do that in an on-premises data center. But all you need to do in the EC2 is enable ENA Express on these network interfaces, and you achieve the same benefits of lower latency and more consistent networking with higher throughput. And so I've shared three examples, Graviton, SRD, and ENA Express, all examples how we're continuing to increase performance while lowering price. I will also say that cost optimization is really part of the Amazon DNA. We're constantly just looking for new ways to optimize costs for our customers. And it shows up in a lot of different ways. For example, we launched new instance families that have better price performance, as I just talked about. We launched new low-cost storage classes. We launched services that help you really dig in and look for where you're underutilizing your current resources. And then we build entirely new capabilities to help automate a lot of cost optimization that you do. One of the things I'm very proud of is S3 Intelligent Tiering. This is our storage class that has now saved customers over $1 billion since launch by automatically looking for objects that aren't being actively accessed and shifting them into lower cost storage. In today's summit, you're going to be able to learn about a lot of things you can do to improve your operational efficiency and reduce your cost. So you can learn about things like our reserved instances, our savings plans, and other ways that you can save up to 72% on your EC2 instance costs. An example of a customer that's really seeing these kinds of benefits is Covestro, which is a leading producer of advanced polymers and high-performance plastics. Using AWS, they can now scale up and scale down based on their various workload requirements, which saves money and time. And they can really optimize their research and development workloads that sort of intermittently need to have a lot of resource, but in steady state, they need much less. With the flexibility that the company got by moving to AWS, they can now balance their computing power based on what they need in just minutes. And they only pay for the specific time that they need it with their given workload. All right, last thing I want to mention or want to talk about uh, in this section is providing a consistent worldwide experience, which AWS does. And we have a consistent set of APIs that you can operate and access in a variety of locations. Now, really what underpins a lot of this is AWS's global infrastructure and global backbone. We, today, our global backbone interconnects 31 regions around the world, including 99 availability zones, and over 410 points of presence. And no other cloud provider has as many regions with the multiple availability zones connected by this low latency, high throughput, and highly redundant backbone network. 
The way we design our availability zones comes from our long history of insisting on very high standards for resiliency. Each region that we operate has multiple AZs, and each AZ consists of one or more physical data centers that are designed to be completely isolated from the other AZs in terms of the location, the power, the water supply, typically separated by kilometers to decorrelate the risk profiles. Now, other cloud providers may have adopted some of AWS's terminology about AZ, but they haven't adopted our high standards to protect your availability of your applications. And our cloud computing environment is designed to satisfy the security requirements of global banks and other organizations that are exceptionally security sensitive. This is all backed by our cloud security tools with over 300 security compliance and governance features and services. But this secure, you know, reliable network um, just doesn't just connect our regions, it also connects AWS to you and your customers, wherever they are around the world. We give you the flexibility to run applications close to where you need them, giving you the consistency as you're using the same network, same control plane and APIs, and AWS services that you have in regions. So whether you need to run your application with single digit millisecond latency, you can choose AWS local zones or AWS wavelength. In Germany, we have the Frankfurt region complemented by three local zones in Munich, Hamburg, and Berlin. Or if you'd like to run your applications in your uh, own data center on-premises, you can choose AWS Outposts. So then just to conclude, we are giving you the best tools to build any kind of application. And so I'd like to share uh, some firsthand stories from a customer of how they've used AWS to build applications and achieve their goals. So please join me in welcoming the Chief Commercial Officer of Flix, Julie Krutz. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Good morning, Berlin. Wow, what a crowd, what an energy. Today, I would like to share with you the story of Flix and how cloud-based platform scalability helped us to make that story happen. AWS is a key ally for us on that journey. So, what is Flix about? Our mission is to provide smart and green mobility for everyone to experience the world. We also say, let's paint the world green. We do that by providing affordable bus and train travel across 40 countries. And since we started, over 300 million people traveled with us. For our customers, that means they get more from life no matter the budget, whether they want to visit friends, family, travel, or simply commute. Let's start at the beginning of the Flix journey. Before 2013, bus travel across Europe was not really a thing because that market used to be heavily regulated. So we had the chance to make a market. And within six years, we created a new way of pan-European travel for an entire generation by offering an alternative of affordable and shared mobility that did not exist before. And by then, we were number one in Europe and had also acquired a couple of companies along the way. So, how does this work? We work with over 1,000 partners, and those partners provide the actual physical product, the ride on the road, while we at Flix focus on everything else, the network planning, pricing, marketing, the online booking journey, and things like customer service and traffic control. Why was Flix successful in doing that? Two things. Number one, we were 100% customer focused in how we optimize our network pricing and offering based on data and analytics. And number two, we used a global scale approach from the start, not only in terms of business strategy, but also in terms of technology platform. At Flix, one cloud-native platform runs it all. All countries, all partners, all destinations. Our cloud journey started in 2017. And the key reason for us to move to the cloud was growth enablement. For us to continue to scale, we had to change how our product and tech teams 
were organized. And we, we organized them around domains that are basically represented by the icons you see behind me. And by doing that, our tech architecture needed to follow. And we moved from an on-prem monolith to a modularized, loosely coupled cloud-based setup. And without that cloud journey, we would not have been able to scale as quickly and cost-effectively as we did. So, the next chapter in our journey, no one saw coming. 2020. Global travel is coming to a halt with COVID. And after seven years of hyper-growth, the world stood still for flicks. We had to shut down operations in almost all markets from one to the other day. It was a time of extreme challenge and extreme uncertainty. However, we decided, let's lean forward. Because we were convinced that ultimately, travel will come back. And so we continue to invest in our platform. In fact, we refocused 35% of our development teams to work on platform scalability topics, where we could, we continue to launch new markets like UK and Brazil. But the biggest move for us in a time of crisis was acquiring Greyhound in October 21. Now, Flix buying Greyhound, that was pretty much a David buys Goliath move. Greyhound, an over 100-year-old bus operator, an iconic brand, but most importantly, the backbone of affordable and shared mobility in the US, fitting our mission perfectly. After buying Greyhound, the number one business priority for us was to integrate it onto the Flix platform, because only by doing that would we be able to use the Flix tools like network planning, marketing, pricing, all the stuff I talked about before, for the Greyhound inventory, which, was, which would give us the value of the acquisition case. And that was not a small feat. Thanks to our great teams, we were able to do that in roughly 14 months after acquiring Greyhound. And the majority of that is based on AWS native services. Now, that speed of integrating Greyhound would not have been possible if we didn't have the backbone of our global cloud-native platform in the first place that we started to invest in in 2017. For us, leaning forward in a time of crisis paid off. 2022 was not only the year where travel came back. For Flix, it was the most successful year in our history. Not only in terms of 1.5 billion revenues and passengers, but also we are now not only market leader in Europe, but also in North America. So what? I would like to leave you with three things. Number one, looking ahead, Flix will continue to paint the world green. And we are excited to launch Chile as our next market very soon. Number two, what could you take away from our story? I think it shows that even as a small and medium-sized business, you can build for a global scale early on by investing in one cloud-native platform and by seeing this as a continuous journey that requires you to, on the one hand side, be flexible in how you organize and continue to reorganize your product and tech teams around areas of business values, while on the other hand, remaining consistent in the way that you keep investing in that platform to get both mid- and long-term business benefits. And number three, for all of you that have not traveled with us, try us. You'll be surprised. Across Europe, we have many one- to three-hour connections that is not only the most affordable choice, but also often the fastest shared mobility choice. For example, if you want to visit Germany's highest mountain, the Zugspitze from Munich. With that, thank you so much for your time and listening to the Flix story.
Thank you, Julie. It is so great to hear how Flix has been able to build using the right tools on AWS. And once you've built something, it's critical then to measure, learn, and just continue iterating, as we've seen in countless industries. And what does that all point to? Well, data, of course. So going back to when AWS was just an idea on a whiteboard and a six-pager, it was clear that helping builders collect, store, and process data was essential. S3 was the first scalable object store built in the cloud and now holds more than 280 trillion objects. But that was just the beginning. We built the first purpose-built database in the cloud with DynamoDB, the first fully managed warehouse with Redshift, and the first machine learning IDE with SageMaker. With all of the explosion we're seeing in AI, we're seeing this with SageMaker, whose active customer count has been growing 80% in the last couple of years. And since introducing these products, we've just continued to launch new features and services that help customers eat more easily create, store, and act on data. Customers like Merck, who can spin up a lab environment for fast data experimentation and help advance their analytic capabilities. They use Amazon SageMaker that helps developers build, train, and deploy machine learning models for nearly every use case. They also use a range of Amazon EC2 CPU and GPU instances. And to host container-based user-facing applications, Merck uses AWS Fargate, which is a serverless pay-as-you-go compute engine that's also helped reduce their compute costs and improve their agility. By working with customers and leaders across all industries and sizes, we've identified three core elements of a data strategy for innovation. First, you need a comprehensive set of services to meet your needs now and into the future. Second, you need solutions that integrate your data sources so that you can easily access them no matter where they live. And third, you need the right governance strategy so that you can free your teams to move faster with their data. Together, we see these elements coming together to help put your data to work and solve some real problems. Earlier, we talked about having the right tools for the job. And when collecting and processing data, it's no different. Data comes in so many different shapes and sizes, and they cover a variety of use cases. Data, of course, evolves as your business changes and grows. And so you need to have tools that help regardless of what shape it takes today. Frankly, you just, a one-size-fits-all solution just does not work. And so whether you're looking to store petabytes of data in a data lake, or accessing cache entries on a microsecond basis, we have offerings that will work. So speaking of data lakes, you know, data lakes are an incredibly popular component for our customers' data landscape these days. To help make fast, data-driven decisions, we encourage customers to store data in open formats at scale that let people run whatever they need to do and process against that data with strong governance and controls. And that's really exactly what data lakes are built for. Of course, I'm a little biased, but Amazon S3, I think, is the best place to build data lakes. We have the most integrations with tight security and governance and very low cost to operate it at scale with multiple storage classes. And frankly, it's the foundation for hundreds of thousands of data lakes. We also support data workloads for your applications with the most complete set of relational databases and eight purpose-built databases like DynamoDB. In the relational data space, Amazon Aurora is a relational database that's built for the cloud with commercial performance and availability at an open source price point. And it has over 100,000 customers. We also have a comprehensive set of services for all your analytics workloads, like data warehouse analytics with Redshift, or big data analytics with EMR, business intelligence with QuickSight, and interactive log analytics with OpenSearch. And these are the kinds of tools that can help you understand how your applications are performing, where they need to be improved, and again, help you spin that flywheel to continually solve your biggest challenges. At AWS, we are innovating on behalf of customers to help deliver the broadest and deepest set of machine learning capabilities for builders of all levels of expertise, removing the undifferentiated heavy lifting so that you can move faster. At the bottom layer, we're innovating in the software and silicon levels. So for example, the AWS Inferentia chip provides up to 70% lower cost per inference than comparable GPU systems. AWS Trainium is the most effective training in the cloud, most cost-effective training. 
And then moving up the stack for ML experts, we have optimized frameworks, including PyTorch and TensorFlow, as well as pre-trained models from Hugging Face. And then to simplify the end-to-end -end process of building machine learning models from labeling data to inference, we have the Amazon SageMaker suite. And then at the top level, we have AI services with built-in machine learning for services like Amazon Transcribe and Textract. So you can easily add ML capabilities to your business applications and workflows without needing that expertise. To make it easy to build and scale generative AI applications with foundation models, we've recently announced Amazon Bedrock and the Amazon Titan models. Bedrock makes foundation models from AI21 Labs, Anthropic, Stability AI, and Amazon accessible via an API with the ability to privately customize models with just a few pieces of labeled data. Now, Bedrock is currently in limited preview, but once as it's rolling out, this service is going to be a massive step forward in generative AI, empowering you to use all the, the standard AWS tools to deploy and scale generative AI applications. LLMs actually already power AWS services like Amazon Code Whisperer, which is an ML-powered code generation service for developers. Now, it generates code recommendations from plain language prompts based on context and other information, such as the prior code and comments that the developers made. And this allows developers to simply write a comment that outlines a specific task just in plain language, such as, you know, write me a Lambda function to parse an event and send a security alert under certain conditions. Code Whisperer automatically determines the cloud service and code libraries that need to be pulled in for a task and then recommends code snippets in real time directly in the IDE. And unlike traditional autocomplete tools, Code Whisperer can generate multiple lines of code or even entire functions. Code Whisperer supports over 15 programming languages and lives directly in your favorite IDE, such as VS Code, IntelliJ, Cloud9, and more. And best of all, it is free for the individual tier. So I encourage each of you to try, try it out. The second pillar around data strategy is integration. And what we hear from customers increasingly is that they want all of their data sources connected so they can quickly access and process data regardless of where it resides. In other words, to break down the silos that often exist between departments and services and between on-premises databases and third-party applications. And that's why we've been working for a few years on building integrations between our services to make it easier to do analytics and machine learning without needing to have people delve into the complex world of legacy extract, transform, and load, or ETL pipelines. Now, today we provide direct integrations with our AWS streaming services so that you can stream data in and analyze it as it's being produced and gather insights to capitalize on opportunities to innovate. We've also integrated Amazon SageMaker with our data warehouse and other database services so you can use that data for machine learning without having to build pipelines or have additional machine learning expertise. And with federated querying on Redshift and Athena, you can run predictive analytics across data that's stored in your operational data stores, data warehouses, and data lakes without any movement of data between them. So these integrations eliminate the need to move that data around to get to the insights. But we also think we can do more. And what we want to do is eliminate the need for you to manage ETL entirely. That would definitely be a wor world that I would like to be in. And this is what we're calling zero ETL. This is our vision. So you can quickly and easily connect to and act on all of your data. As part of this, at reInvent, we announced that Amazon Aurora will support zero ETL integration with Redshift to bring transactional data in Aurora and analytics capabilities in Redshift together. Now, preview customers using this are already reporting that they are seeing this as a game changer. So in one test, for example, they achieved 100,000 inserts into Redshift in less than 20 seconds. So stay tuned on this as we continue rolling this feature out later this year. So with this update, as well as with Redshift's integration with Apache Spark, we're just making it easier to analyze all your data. And in addition to these ongoing investments in Zero ETL, we're making it easier to just connect to all of your data sources, whether they live in AWS or in a third-party application. And if you look across all of our services, we connect to hundreds of data sources, including many SaaS applications, as well as on-premises infrastructure and other clouds, 
again, so you can get access to all of your data. So for example, with Amazon SageMaker's Data Wrangler, which is a low-code visual data preparation tool for machine learning, you can easily import data for your ML models for more than 40 different connectors, including sources like Databricks and Snowflake. We've also just announced the general availability of AWS Data Exchange for Amazon S3 that makes it easy for customers to find, subscribe to, and then use third-party files and objects directly from data providers' S3 buckets. And if you're a data provider, you can license direct access to your hosted data hosted in your S3 bucket in just a few steps. And so this really just results in a faster time to insight as customers can start their analysis with AWS and data in S3 using the provider's data and not having to copy it. And then for the data provider, you also minimize the number of copies you need to make to deliver third-party data, as well as just simplify the overall, the whole process of letting customers find and subscribe to your data. Now, the last pillar I want to talk about is data governance. And this is critical if you're going to connect all your data and want to make it available to teams for deriving insights. The right governance strategy should help you move fast and innovate with well-defined guardrails that give the right people access to the data that they need to do their job. When you have the right guardrails in place, it just sets the whole organization up to move more quickly. And as we see the amount of data expanding constantly, our customers are saying they really want an end-to-end -end strategy that helps them govern their data across the whole journey of that data from creation to storage to, to processing. And they want to make it easier for teams to collaborate and share their data while maintaining the right data quality and security. But creating all of the, the right governance controls can be a pretty complex and time-consuming situation. And so we are working to reduce the number of manual things you need to do to govern your data. So we have AWS Lake Formation that helps you govern and audit your data lakes on S3 and provides row and column level, cell level permissions to help protect your data. For machine learning, we announced new features in SageMaker to address common machine learning governance challenges, including onboarding users, centralizing and documenting model information, and then monitoring how that model is performing over time. And then for true end-to-end -end governance, though, managing data access across all of your services, this is what we are building with Amazon DataZone, which we recently announced as a preview. DataZone is a management service that helps multiple data teams across your organization catalog, discover, share, and then govern your data. It supports the entire lifecycle and provides a unified environment with a rich visual interface so your data teams, again, can move faster and innovate with data. And so I've shared with you now how a comprehensive set of services, integrated data sources, and all the right governance can really help you unleash insights into your data. They come together to form what I would call an end-to-end -end data strategy. So you can store and query data in databases, data lakes, and data warehouses, act on that data with analytics, business intelligence, as well as machine learning, and then catalog and govern access to the data with services like lake formation and data zone. Again, I think this is really a comprehensive set of services to really meet you where you are and your teams are to help you store your data and use the programming languages of, of your choice to get your job done. So to demonstrate how this is happening in practice, I'd like to invite one of our customers uh, to talk a little bit about how data is helping them transform their business. So please join me in welcoming the CIO of Siemens, Hannah Hennig. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Come on, that sounds a little bit lazy. How are you doing? Excellent. It's a beautiful day. I hope you have been able to enjoy the sun. It's beautiful to be here in Berlin. It's a great city which evolved over a couple of years. And it's, by the way, also one of our um, you know, footprints of Siemens. As you know, we have the Siemens Stadt just going to be developed, which is sort of say revamping what has been there in the past and make it even more beautiful than it is today as a city. So I'm very, very um, pleased and really honored to share with you how um, AWS is helping us 
Siemens to drive digital transformation for our customers as well as internally. Now, let me maybe share with you what Siemens stands for, but hopefully, you know, I'm going to make it right because I'm just three years with Siemens and there are people among you who are actually from Siemens who have been there for much longer. So you're going to test me at the end or you're going to judge me at the end, hopefully with best marks. Can I just please raise your hand who is from Siemens? All right, they are all sitting in the front, by the way, so thanks for the fan community. Very good. So, what does Siemens stand for? I guess most of you know, you know, you see the brand, you see the, the name, but where do we actually deliver uh, products to? Who do we help with um, their challenges? So, we are basically saying we are transforming the everyday of our customers in four industries. It's the manufacturing automation industry, of, our, uh, um, of several uh, cross uh, vertical speed, food beverage, process industry, chemical, uh, or, you know, all those companies who are manufacturing. Secondly, we are delivering solutions uh, for buildings, smart buildings and smart grids. We are also delivering solutions in the mobility. The trains you are taking, some of you maybe have taken a train to come over to Berlin, those trains are built by Siemens. And last but not least, we are also delivering very important in the healthcare area. So all of that is obviously very, uh, uh, really the, I would say, the back backbone of each economy. And this is where we are providing IoT solutions to our customers to deliver more with less. Just to give you one example how that looks like, for example, in the, in the industry area, our customers who are manufacturing, they are able to use 50%, up to 50% less material if they are using our digital twin solution product, simulating how a product uh, would be built, how a product would be produced, etc. So massive potential which can be found by uh, and provided by IoT solutions. So what does it mean in terms of um, IoT solutions? How do we provide these? What is it that we are, what makes us special towards the theme of delivering digital transformation to our customers? Well, last year, we launched the Accelerator, a digital business platform which is open and it, co it consists out of three components. Number one, it's a set of curated IoT-enabled hardware and software. We have and are having a growing ecosystem of partners which are adding to the products on the accelerator with their products. And we are displaying all of that on the marketplace, on the internet, where you can see our solutions and our portfolio set. Now, all these products, what's new about it is that they are really built open, flexible, interoperable via APIs and they are scalable. And scalable in that sense that they are able, they are composable, they can be consumed in scale, they can be also consumed by mid-sized companies. And this is where AWS helps us by moving, for example, our software products into SaaS to ensure that we are able to provide subscription-based products, models where you know, our customers, even mid-sized companies, can profit from that. Now, that's the way of where AWS is helping us to digitize our portfolio towards our external market to our customers. AWS also helps us with our internal digital transformation. Now, what I didn't say at the beginning is that Siemens actually being a technology leader in these four industry sectors, we are actually uh, providing our solutions in 200 countries with over 300,000 associates and ourselves, we also have over 120 factories. Now, you can imagine with that size of a company, we have a vast number of data. And as Kevin said before, that data needs to be managed. It needs to be properly managed to allow us to really act as a data-driven company which is able to leverage the data we have from ourselves from our 
partners, our suppliers, our customers to take decisions ahead of our competition. So when you have this vast amount of data, it's great obviously to have the tooling from AWS, you know, to make it all digestible, easy to handle, etc. However, not all of our business colleagues obviously have the knowledge as you have. Most of you, are, I guess, are in the IT or in the technology area. We also needed to find a way to ensure that our business colleagues are able to consume that beautiful, rich number of tool sets in an easy way so that they can focus on drive the outcome of that data instead of dealing with you know, RT, IT architecture, security, etc. pp. So what did we do? The team came up, the IT team came up with a great idea. We built up something we call data lake to go. It should be as easy as coffee to go. When you go to Starbucks, if you go to McDonald's, you grab your coffee and then you go. It has been filled in, pre-filled for you, you just put your flavor in and then you go. Exactly that's what Data Lake to go about. We have provided a pre-configured set of data analytics and AI tooling pre-packaged in a project account, which is provisioned to our business units from an enterprise-governed AWS account. And this really is a way how our business is now really able to consume data instantly with no friction, seamlessly, in a very speedy way. And as you have seen before, we have over 500 projects running in parallel just using that pre-configured set of components. With that, obviously, it's important to say, and you know it as well, uh, among you there are also many developers, the richness of data is great, it's great to analyze it, but you still cannot harvest the value of that if you are not able to, to act on that, to visualize it and to act on that. To be able to do that, you need to add another component beside um, cloud enablement via AWS and data lake to go data management. You need to add a way to build an application on top of that. Workflow, also visualization, all of that to allow you understanding what the data analyzed means to you and how you can use it for recommendation. So that's where we inject our local platform, Mendix. I hope some of you have heard about it. If not, please have a look at it. It will also increase your productivity when you develop. It's like Data Lake to go. Mendix is a set of pre-configured components which allows you to build applications instantly. It, if it took you months before or even years to build an application, here you can reduce your development time to weeks and days. So that's where we see you know, how we leverage each other. And to give you a true example of how that works in practice, a use case which is combining all these components into one, where we actually had, have provided to our um, plant, one of our plants in Nuremberg, which is, provide, which is constructing um, a building products for our customers in an individual way. We call it make to order or make to engineer. So each order is special. Because each order is special, you cannot really apply mass production everywhere. So what we have, to, what we have done, we have provided them so-called solution, which is called intelligent document mapping, which is allowing now to save time uh, finding the right components, which is displayed via bill of material in the construction paper and match it. This matching mechanism has been where we have been using the tool set of AWS within this intelligent document mapping solution. And the outcome of that was that obviously with avoiding uh, colleagues in the factories to needing to match all these components over a vast period of time, it was fully automated. And that's where we actually have been able with this solution to deliver 700,000 700, euro just for one area of process of savings for one year for this one plant. So you can imagine if you multiply it for several process areas, you, know, you will have a vast uh, amount of potential and you can scale it now, at least within Siemens, we will scale it now to minimum 10, 10 companies, uh, 10 plants, and we will also 
industrialized so that also small, medium enterprises, which are in manufacturing, they are able to leverage that. So you can see that, as Kevin said, the two set of AWS will really help, you know, with combination of um, data management, with the tooling on data management, as well as cloud, as well as low-code platform Mendix. With all of that, we can harvest a lot of benefit and provide a good solution for our customers to make it all happen and also provide sustainable products and productivity. So next is obviously that we want to continue with this great partnership and deliver the best to our customers so that they can deliver more with less. Thank you. All right, thank you, Hannah. It is so great to see Siemens executing on an effective end-to-end -end data strategy on AWS. Earlier, I started by saying, I encourage you to think about a problem that you could help catalyze solving. We've talked about some of the tools that AWS provides to help you do that, and then all of the data services that can help you measure, learn, and iterate to improve your solutions. Today, I encourage you to take advantage of all of the learning that we have in, in the expo hall and all of the sessions, work with other customers, learn from each other, explore, learn, and I am positive that you can have a tremendous impact. Thank you for coming this morning, and I look forward to seeing you around the show. <laughs>